Hey there. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for your patience. Um, I'm Josh Berkus. I work in the Red Hat open source practice office um, on Kubernetes. Uh, but in a previous life, um, I spent a long time working on the PostgreSQL database, um, which is how I got involved uh, supporting um, Andy Huynh working on his research um, on robust tuning. Um, so this is Andy Huynh, uh, who's a PhD candidate in computer science at Boston University. Um, I... And uh, this is his professor, uh, Manos Afanasoulis, who is a professor of computer science at Boston University. Um, and um, they are going to uh, explain a little bit about robust tuning um, and LSM trees. Um, so we're going to start out, uh, Manos, uh, if you wanted to explain... Uh, overall, the purpose of the research. Thank you, Josh, uh, for the nice introduction. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm very happy to uh, be here and talk to you about our research. I will spend a few minutes uh, introducing and motivating the problem, and then Andy can take the lead on explaining the core details of the work that he's been uh, doing all these uh, past few years. Um, so uh, my slides have the title, a Prelude to Robust LSM Trees, because uh, Andy will talk about Robust LSM Trees, but I will talk about what is LSM trees and uh, why we need to make them robust. So uh, LSM trees are actually um, a, a data structure that is behind many different storage engines today. Here I have a list of them, uh, the many notable names, LevelDB, RocksDB, uh, SQLite, Bigtable, HBase, uh, WarTiger, I use the LSM data structure under the hood. And, uh, uh, and the reason that this is happening is because LSM trees were actually designed at the get-go to offer very efficient writes, very efficient ingestion, which has become a very important requirement as we have more and more data uh, that we want to store. At the same time, there's a lot of research on actually making competitive, uh, making them have competitive reads while, while they, they offer very good space utilization. Yet another uh, key characteristic as uh, storage and monetary budget is actually also a consideration. So with all this, actually, it has been a very, uh, you know, fertile topic over the last few years with a lot of research happening in various data management conferences and systems conferences exactly to develop these techniques of efficient ingestions, competitive rights, and, and uh, um, competitive uh, uh, space utilization. Now, uh, one key characteristic that is happening more and more is that all the systems that we are discussing and essentially data management in general is happening increasingly in the cloud. And when this is the case, uh, we have a lot of new challenges that, have, that we have to face. And the most important one is unpredictability, which is the core of our, of our research here. So we have unpredictability in terms of workloads, access patterns, and ingestion rates, and also in terms of compute and memory storage and memory and storage that might be available to us while executing our workloads. Overall, this makes small uh, data, small overhead, small benefits to become big because they accumulate as we have multiple instances of our systems on the cloud. And we also have other um, considerations like energy and monetary, and monetary costs that we have to consider. So in the research that we are doing in the lab, we're actually f uh, focusing on unpredictability uh, in, uh, in uh, the availability and type of resources in the incoming workload, which is the focus of this uh, of this talk today and in regulation assumptions, for example, data retention and deletion. Uh, this unpredictability in all of those three actually hurts the way, or let's say puts a, a, a big challenge on the way we design and tune data systems. And today, as I said, we'll, we'll talk about how the incoming workload unpredictability uh, challenges us and what we can do to, to address that. So overall, uh, the, the process of tuning data systems is a, is a process that takes three inputs. Uh, the, the details of the underlying hardware, the details of the access patterns and the expected workload, and the data size and distribution, and through an optimization problem actually gives us uh, the tuning and the various uh, physical design decisions that we need to, uh, to have in order to, to, to offer the best behavior for our system. So unpredictability actually may lead, may lead away from the optimal, and we need to, to account for that. 
So uh, it, the, the lab has done a lot of research on how to address all the forms of unpredictability that I mentioned before. And here I have a list of papers where I, I, I welcome everybody to go on our website and, and read them. But today we'll be talking about uh, LSM trees uh, we're about how to tune LSM engines under workload uncertainty. Before um, giving the mic to Andy, I'd like to, to give a very quick LSM3 primer uh, to bring every, everybody up to speed about what really is an LSM3, and then Andy can take uh, the rest of the discussion. So LSM3 are, are essentially key value stores. They store uh, uh, collections of keys and values. Uh, this is very generic, so the key values can be uh, relational data, document data, semi-structured data, any, any type of data actually can, can be essentially modeled one way or another to a key value pair. And the way it works is that it has a memory buffer that accumulates key value pairs. Uh, once the, this memory buffer is full, the key value pairs are sorted based on the key and are written on the disk as a sorted run. So once we accumulate enough of these sorted runs, we're actually merging them to create a bigger, easier to search in sorted run in order to ultimately create a collection of sorted runs with exponential increasing sizes and logarithmic in terms of uh, and, and logarithmic in number in terms of the uh, entries that we have all, uh, overall inserted into our data system. So when we are turning our attention to querying such a key value store, we uh, we first uh, have to search into the memory buffer to because it, this contains always the most recent data. And then if we don't find what we are looking there, we have to go to the uh, uh, sorted files on the disk. Now we have fence pointers that allows us to avoid doing a, a binary search on, on disk. And by doing so in, in memory, the core idea here is that we store the smallest key per, uh, per page in memory. So we do binary search in memory and then we go to the corresponding file. So if we're looking for a key, in this example, key five, we will do one IO per level uh, of our LSM tree. You will, you will notice here that key, that key five exists only in the last level. So uh, the, the IOs that we had to do for level one and level two are actually unnecessary. So typically the LSM is augmented by a filter, typically blue filters, but actually is a membership, is a probabilistic membership data structure that allows us to skip most of the unnecessary IOs. So here the blue filter says would say no for level one, so we would have to skip it altogether, but then it would say yes for L2, so we'll do an, an unnecessary access over there. And it, the, eventually it will say yes for level three to find the, uh, the key that we're looking for. So already this design uh, gives us a very nice tunable uh, system. So on the one hand, we have a memory tuning uh, option where we can actually have bigger filters, uh, allocate more memory to our filters to have fewer false positives, essentially having a memory versus read cost, memory space versus read cost trade-off. And on the other hand, we can actually tune the way we're merging, uh, how eagerly we're merging, and Andy will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and if we merge more, we, we can have fewer runs, thus having a trade-off between the read cost, the number of runs uh, dictates the read cost versus the update cost, the, the eagerness of merging dictates the update cost. So there's a lot of approaches trying to optimize um, such a system given knowledge about the workload. And typically all these approaches assume that we have exact knowledge of the workload, uh, the data set and in, in return, we are actually getting the best tuning. However, the problem that we're trying to discuss today is what, what happens if we, we know something about the workload, but this comes with uncertainty. In other words, the workload can be anything in a region around an expected workload. So this is the core of, of today's talk, uh, to model and tune with an uncertainty region of workload in mind. So let me um, essentially pause here. Uh, let me also uh, introduce Andy for his, uh, for his um, talk in the, in the next few minutes. And let me, before uh, do, giving the baton, uh, I think I, uh, let me say that there's a lot of research in the lab about in the internals of the um, of the LSM trees, the compaction policy, the, the mitigation of impacts of deletes and regulation in general, how to exploit new hardware, and of course there are certain in assumptions like the workload that we discussed today. And this work, uh, there's a lot of uh, people that, that are involved and several. Um, uh, um, sponsors that have been helping us. And of course, Red Hat has been uh, on the, at the forefront of supporting us. So uh, thank you uh, for your attention. I'm happy to take any quick questions. And um, after that, I think Andy can um, uh, go on with his presentation.
Yeah, I'm going to actually uh, fill in a few things because I know that we have um, uh, I know that we have a bunch of people listening in who are not that steeped in uh, the background of database design or database engineering. So just update. So LSM trees are an alternative to somewhat older data structures like B trees, correct? Yes. So what's the Absolutely. advantage? Yeah. We've got a whole bunch of databases that use LSM trees. What's the, like, on, on a more macro level, what's the advantage of using an LSM tree to using one of these older data structures? So, okay, uh, as I briefly mentioned, the main thing is that LSM trees were actually optimized for, for fast ingestion because they are transforming uh, random writes in different locations on the disk to sequential writes that they were very efficient in the era of hard drives, but it but they remain more efficient than random reads even in the era of SSDs. So th th this is a key consideration. And the second key consideration is space utilization. SM3 is typically in almost any practical uh, deployment you're going to have today, they have less than 10% uh, uh, space overhead, while B plus 3 can have up to 2x space overhead. Mm -hmm. So the fast insertions are why we're using them for things like uh, Prometheus um, for the Ceph metadata um, uh, and, and other sort of data collection um, opportunities. Okay. Um, if we want to switch over to Andy... All right, uh, let's see. Yeah, close well, everything. Right. Yeah, well, Andy's getting this set up. One of the other things, so I want to say one of the reasons why I found this research really interesting is that, um, uh, you know, I worked on Postgres for a really long time. Uh, Postgres's primary data store is a B plus tree. Um, I think Postgres was actually the original test case for the B plus tree. The, um, and, um, and there's an, a lot, a lot of knowledge about how, um, B plus tree tuning um, and how to manage that tuning under different circumstances, et cetera. There is not anywhere near as much about LSM trees um, just because they're a younger data structure. Yeah. So we have a question from the audience. Um, I, uh, Utkarsh, uh, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, if I'm not, my apologies. Um, I wants to know how is the bloom filter kept in sync with the disk when the system recovers from a crash? Um, That's an excellent question. So I can take it. Uh, that's an excellent question. So essentially, what we, I didn't discuss in my very brief overview of LSM trees is that Bloom filters are actually stored with the files uh, on disk. So what happens is that the Bloom filters, of course, they need to be in memory to be efficient in squaring, and that happens through caching. However, the stable version of the Bloom filters is actually stored next to the files that they correspond to. So there's no need, uh, and, and every file, remember, every file is immutable. There's no in-place update. The only type of update that happens is merging of existing immutable files. So when we merge two, two, two files, we create a new file that has an updated Bloom filter. This is uh, um, uh, safe there on the disk with, with the rest of the of the data of the, of the SSD file. And if there's a crash, we just have to repopulate our cache with the Bloom filter blocks. Okay, with that, Andy, you want to get onto your research? Cool. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, everyone, again for tuning in. So, uh, one question in the chat, real quickly. So, how does this endure tuning affects RocksDB and its native performance? So, I will get to that. There'll be a lot of plots, uh, Mayor, uh, at the end of the presentation, closer to the end. Yeah. Um, but we'll explain, I guess, the difference between like how certain tunings can essentially affect performance and whether or not like a, how to evaluate essentially a good tuning versus like a not so robust tuning. So yeah, um, but yeah, this uh, this work in Dur is uh, it, it's a paper that was presented in BLDB 2022, so uh, in Australia last September, and this is again with uh, some additional collaborators, so Harshal and Evermaria who couldn't be here today, and of course uh, myself and Manos. 
Um, yeah, so we'll take it away. And Josh, at any point in time too, this is a conversation, right? So if you want to interrupt me and if there's any questions, we can definitely kind of talk about it and address what's going on. So yeah, um, Manos definitely touched upon essentially the fact that LSM trees are used in a wide variety of like backends. But one of the biggest uh, key points that I kind of want to point out is the reason being is LSM trees are extremely flexible. Um, there's a lot of different essentially tuning knobs or different uh, configurations that you can do to essentially morph an LSM tree to the shape that you want for like a very particular application. And it makes it very, very nice. Um, but the issue is, is all of these tuning knobs eh, really dictates the performance that you could possibly get, right? Uh, if you mistune your LSM tree to any degree, you might end up with kind of subpar performance. So one of the biggest questions you can ask is how do you go about tuning these knobs, right? Um, so Anas went over uh, very quickly again, like a LSM overview. Uh, one, of the, one of the important points that I really want to point out here is the different types of tuning parameters that you can kind of uh, look at when it comes to an LSM tree. So there's three kind of small, uh, small parameters that I'm looking at here today. So the memory buffer, again, this is the in-memory buffer that you place all of your key value, values in before you flush it to disk. Uh, that buffer size gets dictated by the user. Um, in addition, bloom filter memory as well, the amount of memory that you allocate for your bloom filters on disk uh, is also a choosable parameter. Um, for the sake of this talk, we kind of treat the two of them as the same, uh, in which we say that the two of them together make up your memory budget. And you kind of decide uh, among, along your memory budget how to allocate between the two different memory types, so the buffer memory and the filter memory. Uh, additionally, as Manas had mentioned before, uh, files on disk get compacted into exponentially increasing sizes, and that kind of exponential rate or growth between uh, between files is dictated by this parameter called size ratio in T. In addition, lastly, uh, there's a way to, uh, there's a compaction policy which essentially dictates how you decide to essentially merge your files, whether or not you decide to do it eagerly with uh, leveling, where every single time a file is flushed, you immediately merge it with the current file that you're looking at, or tiering. Uh, where you decide to merge a little bit lazier when you wait until your full level is full, and then you can merge all the files in one go there. So, right. yeah, okay. And yeah, and all ahead. of these, yeah, I was going to say, right. And and all of these are user configurable depending on the system, yeah? Yes. So depending on which, uh, like which database you're kind of looking at. So for example, RocksDB is what we primarily work with in the lab, mostly because it's the most flexible. Uh, and this essentially allows you to configure all of these different uh, tuning knobs very easily. Otherwise, for kind of other, mm, other applications, you might need to dig underneath the hood to figure out exactly how to tune these knobs, but they're still exposed to, to like a user or somewhere down the line. They're exposed to some part of the application pipeline. Yeah. So. With the fact that we have all of these different knobs, uh, the natural question to kind of ask is, okay, uh, if you have you know all these different choices, uh, but you want to essentially you know change these knobs based off of a particular workload, uh, how do you go about defining a workload? So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking, I guess, about like the different um, query types that we have in like an LSM tree, and a little bit more detail to each one. Okay. So, so you're defining so you're defining workloads as as type of query. Yes. Yep. So LSM trees essentially support more or less like four kind of basic uh, query types. Uh, well, really three query types, but we kind of split uh, one particular query into two types of queries. So point reads, which encompasses empty reads and non-empty reads. Uh, we say essentially empty reads are cases where you give a key to the LSM tree and you get a null result because the key doesn't exist, right? Um, and then a non-empty read uh, is basically a point read, but you're just guaranteed to get the key back. Uh, the reason why we differentiate these two is at least in the academic literature, there's a lot of, there's there's been a lot of evidence essentially that like if you can kind of estimate the uh, proportion between these two types of point queries, you can actually optimize for uh, one or the other. Um, yeah, in addition, we have, yeah. Oh, go yeah ahead. Actually, I was say, one of the things I want to comment for the non-database people, um, which is true mm -hmm. across all kinds of data structures is that empty reads are not necessarily faster. Um, because right. you, you have to actually verify that there are no compliant results, which can sometimes mm -hmm. take longer yeah. than finding a result. 
Yeah, and I'll go a little bit more in detail on how each of these query types exactly work, um, and then how we essentially model them. Uh, so yeah, after point queries, you also have write scans or like range reads, essentially where you're taking a look at uh, a particular range of keys. And in this instance, you're more or less, you kind of have to go through every single level of the LSM tree, or you have to scan every file to make sure that, you know, if it hold, if it has the potential to hold a key in your range, you have to take a look. Um, and then lastly, writes, as we talked about in LSM trees, because LSM trees buffer writes, uh, you don't really see the impact of writes over t uh, at the beginning or instantaneously. Uh, it's more of like a background compaction that happens. So writes really, uh, you, you see the effects of writes, I guess, once you start to compact files over and over again. Um, Dimitri wants to know, uh, do we have literature uh, references at the end? Yes. Yeah, we have a couple of literature references okay. at the end. Um, Otherwise, you can always talk to me offline. We, I can point to like a couple different like seminal papers, at least in LSM trees, uh, but also just like database tuning in general. Um, yeah. So with these kind of query types, uh, I with these four different types of queries, we can essentially break down a workload into essentially a proportion of all these different query types, right? Like if you know you want to treat all of them equally, you have essentially a probability vector or like a histogram essentially of 25% in every bin, right? Where empty reads, non-empty reads, range reads, and writes show up about like a quarter of the time. And with that, uh, technically, oh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Meyer wants to ask about read-write strategy. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what he's asking because he's like, does it follow any specific read-write strategy? No. Uh, does this follow read-write strategy? Uh, as in, do else? Does it follow any? Maybe Meyer, if you could uh, elaborate exactly on that question, I think we could definitely take yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But essentially, with the recipe of uh, here are my choices and here's my workload, you can essentially go about tuning. Like this is technically all you need, right? Um, I yeah to to kind of go over it, like formally what do I mean by the LSM tuning problem uh, given a workload so in this instance a tuple of all the different types like proportion of queries that you're looking at um, and your design choices in this instance your memory like your buffer memory filter memory size ratio compaction policy and then a particular cost that you're looking for right um, you can put this in like formal mathematical terms where all all this statement is saying is find me a design phi that minimizes my cost C based off of an input workload W, right? And although this is specific, at least to the LSM tree that at least I'm looking at right now, uh, this is actually very generic, right? Uh, I think as systems people, we almost always do this subconsciously uh, for you know any sort of performance configurations. If you spin up like a Redis instance, right? You have some target idea of what you expect the application to look like, which is essentially your workload. And then with Redis, you have like a bunch of different other configurations that you can use. Uh, and then you're specifically trying to minimize like a particular cost, right? Whether it's latency, whether it's IOs, whether it's like consistency metrics, et cetera. This is in its purest form, essentially a statement for all generic tuning problems. Yeah. Oh, wait, go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, we can pause here for a fact. Yeah, there was uh Mayu actually was having a question about his question was mainly uh, about stuff like copy on 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 uh write. And um I was just pointing out that LSM trees were mostly for data that is not rewritable. Um for for data that that accumulates um uh but right. does not get updated ever. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, well, not necessarily. I guess uh, LSM trees can, like, they do support updates at the end of the day. So if we really take a look, so uh, if I, uh, here, I will, if we go back to essentially the different types of queries again, um, a write essentially encompasses an update at the end of the day. So because items are buffered uh, when you place like a new key into like a buffer, right? Uh, LSM trees kind of have this like special way to handle updates where, um, if you place the same key that was already written to the LSM tree, the next time you go to query a read, uh, the read is guaranteed to give you the newest entry. So technically, you have a history of all keys that you have seen before. Uh, but when you go to read, you'll receive the newest item. Uh, the only exception to this, though, is over time, as files are compacted together, if we see duplicate keys, we'll always take the newest key once during the compaction. Uh, and the same sort of philosophy also happens with deletes, actually. So 
when it comes to deletes, LSM trees actually insert a special key, uh, key value pair. So the key is still the same. It's the exact key that you want to delete. Uh, but the value is a special uh, signature value that we call, generally we call it tombstone. Um, so as that tombstone propagates through all of the compacted files, once it meets the key, once it sees like a key uh, that matches, uh, it'll essentially delete the key like persistently on disk. But yeah, it does handle updates and uh, uh, updates and deletes. Yeah. So I'll explain a little bit more, actually, this is a great segue too, because I'll explain a little bit more about each of the types of queries and essentially how you can kind of estimate the cost. Um, so I'm particularly looking at, at least in this work, we're taking a look at uh, the, the average number of IOs. We're taking like a very you know pragmatic approach to this and just essentially counting the number of potential uh, disk IOs you'd have to spend. And this is essentially what we want to minimize. Um, so for an empty read, right, uh, as I'm going through the tree, essentially, as I probe each level, I'm actually just looking at the bloom filters first. And the only single time that I ever end up having a IO is when I have a false positive on the bloom filter. Right. So I can essentially estimate or count the expected number of uh, super flip or yeah, extra IOs that I will be uh, taking by summing over the false positive rates of the bloom filters. Um, otherwise, for non-empty reads, it's a little bit more complicated. But if you think about it, uh, at every single level, there's a certain probability that you are expected to find the particular key that you're looking for. And uh, as you're going through the levels, though, additionally, you have uh, some false positive rate for all the levels that you've seen previously. And together, this kind of gives you like an estimation on the total number of IOs that you would actually see. And it, this is great because we essentially get to form a relationship between the IO, the IO count, and the decision variables that we're taking a look at. Um, in addition, right, range reads are very similar. Where, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, you for range reads you have some sort of selectivity that you can kind of model. So, like longer range reads, for example, might have a very high selectivity where it's trying to look over your full key range. While lower selectivity, you might be looking at a small you know, few uh, keys, like maybe one to two. Um, and then additionally, every single time though, that you find a file where it potentially has the key, like a key within your key range, you have to do an IO at that point, just to uh, check whether the file has the key. Um, and then writes, writes are the most interesting, uh, interesting to kind of like form a relationship between your design variables and the number of IOs. Um, because instantaneously, when you give a write to a buffer, you essentially see like you see no latency increase, right? You give it to your memory buffer and then everything's good. You don't see any IOs at that particular time. Um, so you only you only see one single IO once your buffer is actually full. On the other hand, though, your actual number of IOs that you would see from a single write really does incur from the number of merges that that essentially write has caused down the line, right? So every single time you write and your buffer flushes, there's a chance that once that buffer flushes, you trigger a series of compactions over time. And in the background, you might have a thread that spins and essentially does these compactions, um, but it's still causing essentially an IO hit every single time you have to merge files, right? And so to be, I guess, more specific about the tuning problem that we're looking at, uh, the LSM tuning problem, I'm particularly looking at minimizing the IO cost and the, our cost function, to put it formally, is essentially just a weighted sum over the different, uh, what is it, uh, query types based off of their expected costs. Okay, so we're measuring performance in terms of how much I.O. gets generated for each request. Yeah, um, and this is kind of interesting, right? So I.O.s is definitely probably the easier thing to kind of measure because it's a counting problem, right? You can just kind of count the expected number of times you're going to take a look at a file or open up a file. Um, it's harder to do with something like latency, right? But as we'll see later in the results, uh, IO translates actually very well to latency. Um, this probably is again due to like mem memory hierarchy, right? Where like IOs to disk are one of the slowest things that you could possibly do in a system. Um, but yeah, we'll see later in the results that like minimizing for IO translates very, very well to min minimizing uh, latency. Uh, Dimitri wants to know what the probability functions in the non-empty reads formula were for. Uh, 
Yes, so the bloom filter uh, in the non-MT reads. Oh, are we talking about? I see. Um, yeah, so the pro so for a non-MT read, because you're you're basically guaranteeing that, like, you're saying that, okay, yeah, uh, I guarantee that when you query a tree, you can essentially receive a key. Um, you we can essentially uh, check or like measure the expected number of IOs by first taking a look at. Uh, whether or not like the leaks uh, in expectation, the probability that the query is satisfied at level one, uh, plus the probability that's satisfied at level two, plus the probability it's satisfied at level, et cetera, all the way down. Um, but each of these probabilities essentially gets weighted into the uh, false positives from you reading from the levels above. So yeah. <laughs> So as a, as a very quick uh, comment about the last question about probabilities, I just want to clarify in case that was part of the question that these are, uh, this is the the, the probability that the bloom filter has a false positive. It comes from the, the very nature of the bloom filter. That is a probabilistic membership test or membership data structure, uh, membership test data structure that allows us to say whether a, a key is part of a set uh, with a probability of saying of having a false positive, and this is the false positive probability that actually leads to some unnecessary IOs. But these are a, a very small number compared to what it would have been without uh, blue filters at all. Yeah, thank you for that, Manas. Okay, um, so this is this is essentially just setting up the stage then, because again, this is like a very standard tuning problem where you only have knowledge or you just assume something about your workload, right? But uh, I, the, the focus of today's talk that I kind of want to go over essentially is just this idea of like, what does it mean to essentially uh, formulize a robust problem? Or like what, you know, Manas had mentioned before, uncertainty within like your workload. What does that exactly mean? So uh, we can start by taking a look essentially at that by first taking a look at what, what, are, we, what are we exactly doing when we essentially tune right, with like a single workload in mind. Uh, so on the left here, I essentially have uh, a visual representation of like what a workload would look like inside of a geometric space. Uh, so for, you know, because we can't see in 4D, uh, <laughs> I'm putting point reads, uh, so non-empty and empty point reads on one axis, range reads on another axis, and writes on uh, the last axis. And because my workload essentially is a, you know, it's like a histogram or like a proportion of different types of queries. Uh, all of them have to sum up to one. And what I essentially create is this triangle, which is a probability simplex, which essentially is just the space of all possible workloads, right? So like, you know, I could pick a corner of the triangle and what that essentially says is like, yeah, I, I'm expecting all of my, uh, excuse me, all of like for that particular corner, it would be it would represent a workload where you expect all of your queries to be a single type of query. And I have a little star here uh, pointing to W0, which you can kind of uh, you know assume, for example, in this instance, that it's a representative workload, like a expected workload that we're looking at. So if we take a look at what does it mean to actually tune a data system, subconsciously we kind of do this, but like we essentially form like a visual, like uh, a cost surface, uh, for lack of a better term. But uh, here, essentially, I have size ratio on one axis, bloom filter memory, which is one of two of our choices uh, on the bottom two axes, and then the cost IOs on the top axis, right? And depending on your choice of size ratio and bloom filter, you essentially get a single cost. And you can essentially plot a cost surface. And when we're essentially tuning for a data system and we have all these choices, what we're subconsciously doing is navigating the surface and trying to find the absolute minimum point, right? So in this instance, I have this uh, pink circle that represents the optimal configuration between size ratio and bloom filter memory for this particular workload. And this is great and dandy, right? Especially if you know the uh, future workloads are the exact same as this W0. But what if I were to draw like a, you know, I could draw like a circle or like a neighborhood and take a look at different workloads that are essentially around W0. And the interesting part is for every single workload in this neighborhood, you essentially have a different cost surface, right? And the optimal configuration for a particular workload will not be the same for neighboring workloads. Uh, so in this instance, if you tune for W0, if your work, 
if your workload in production actually shifts a little bit, you know, to one side, uh, you will actually end up with like a suboptimal tooting. So we can essentially so, take a look at this. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So why would workloads vary like that? That's a great question, right? So why do workloads vary in the first place? Uh, this could definitely be just to, like trends based off of, you know, the user inputs over time, like uh, humans might change. Like we're habitual creatures, yes, but we do change like what kind of data we want to look at. But one of the uh, kind of more obvious things is application changes, right? So applications are constantly changing uh, and the workloads that they essentially ping to the database is always going to be different every time you add like a new feature, for example, right? Um, so as database practitioners, when we take a look essentially at tuning our database, it's really hard for us uh, because we need some assumptions on what type of applications are going to be accessing our DB. Uh, and if those applications change over time, we need to change essentially our layouts over time. So, so like, for example, you might start out with an application that doesn't do any range reads. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. somebody adds a reporting feature without necessarily telling you. Right. Yeah. And that definitely would be like a common thing for, um, right. A everyone with like different app, like with the DB, uh, with application uh, developers, you're basically looking at the DB as some way to access data. So, you know, if you give you a API to do range reads, someone at some point will eventually use that API to do range reads. Yeah. Um, right. But, uh, so going back again to like this uh, suboptimal tuning, if we kind of take a look at like the histogram of performance, it's very obvious to see what ends up happening, right? So like the first workload, you can see the cost is much lower, which is very good. Um, and it's like exactly where we want. We would pick, you know, we would want essentially our tuning to essentially do as low as, po uh, to have as low of a cost as possible. Um, but if we were to take a look at our separate, our other workload, workload two at the bottom, right? Uh, this cost is much higher. Um, and it's it's a bit bad, right? Because again, if your workload slowly drifts over time, you're going to experience both costs at one point or another. So I talked a little bit again about like, uh, what does it mean to essentially tune nominally? Uh, for the rest of the talk, there's only like kind of three parts left, um, which I'll talk a little bit about Endure, the Endure pipeline, and uh, essentially the evaluation of Endure. And Endure is, this, uh, is our method to essentially incorporate uncertainty in uh, the LSM tuning problem, right? So we saw this slide before, uh, and this is the exact same problem formulation, again, where you only have knowledge about like one workload. Um, and I'm just going to label this uh, the nominal problem. So this is very common, at least for the operations research community, where we essentially have two problems. Uh, the nominal and the robust problem. So we'll label this one as the nominal problem because we only have nominal knowledge of our workload. Right. Once I draw this neighborhood and try to incorporate this neighborhood, uh, I'm going to essentially come up with a new analogous problem or a slightly different problem than nominal. So there needs to be some definitions here. So this green uh, egg that I drew before around W0, we'll call the uncertainty neighborhood of workloads. And we... this uncertainty neighbor is essentially a set of all the workloads that you could see around, and it's parameterized by some value, right? Rho. How, how do we figure out and the in... size of Rho? Ah, that's, that's a good question. So we'll, we'll go over that uh, in a slide or two. But essentially, uh, okay. as a prelude to that, um, you can kind of like, this is almost like an ML problem you could kind of think of. Uh, you can essentially learn like in expectation what kind of uncertainty you may experience over time, right? Uh, so like, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit more afterwards uh, in more detail because there'll be needs to be a little bit more uh, massaging of exactly what this uncertainty neighborhood is first before I def define row. But there are many ways to do it. Yeah. Um, so the robust problem, though, once I have this uncertainty neighborhood, is an analogous problem to the nominal problem, where, again, uh, I'm still trying to find a design that minimizes my cost. The only difference, though, is that my workload is now uh, part of a set of possible workloads, right? Um, so it, it's interesting, because uh, it, on paper, this looks very simple, but this actually turns into like a much more complex problem. So. Let's see what what is it what does a solution to the robust problem exactly look like, right? So again, I have this co these cost surfaces uh, from what we've seen before, 
And in this instance, I have like a radius or like an uncertainty neighborhood that I'm looking at, right? And if I were to take a look at just these two workloads and try to pick a robust configuration, uh, I would pick a different configuration that essentially mm, doesn't do super well on our expected work or might not do uh, the minimally on our expected workload, but kind of reduces the overall average cost. So I can take a look at that same histogram that I was looking at before, right? And we can take a look essentially at what does it mean to be robust? So again, nominal for workload one and two, you see a big swing in difference between the costs, between this pink dotted, uh, pink dotted bar. Uh, on the other hand, a robust configuration, the difference in performance between two workloads is going to be a little bit smaller. So essentially the standard deviation or like, yeah, you could say like the error rate between your performance among different workloads is going to be much smoother, right? And the interesting thing is, is, you know, okay, someone's going to ask like, okay, Andy, I, you're doing two workloads, right? Like you could just essentially run the config, like these configurations, run both workloads and check the performance and then kind of take, you know, the more robust one of the two. Um, but the issue is, is how do you do this for like a continuous set or like a infinite set of workloads, right? So, you know, this problem starts to scale pretty badly. Like if you have five, 10, 20 workloads, you don't want to deploy different configurations and test out every workload because it's very, very expensive. Uh, so we essentially want a systematic way to do this without having to test every possible workload. I don't know. I have to, I have to say in the old days, yeah. we would have actually just tested every single workload. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I, I in fact <laughs> have done that. So... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, what is it? Definitely for some of the, the the earlier parts of this work, we definitely did a lot of testing over different workloads. Like, uh, for example, like the right TPC, the TPC benchmarks, right? Yeah. Um, half of the different ones, like TPC H, is just thirty workloads. So, like, technically, you know, for modern hardware nowadays, thirty workloads is not that much. You could probably, you know, deploy a configuration and test all thirty workloads, uh, and then pick the robust configuration of all the ones that you tested. Um, but again, as we get to like, you know, more and more data or different types of workloads, it's, it becomes very expensive. Like this is a problem that you know, will not solve itself. Yeah. Well, and actually the big thing, honestly, is that with some very large data sets, you don't have access to a test data set that is even within the same order of magnitude as your production data. Right. Yeah. That is definitely true as well. Big data. Cool. Okay. So to get back again on, a. Josh's question before about like, um, how do you essentially come up with this parameterization of row or essentially how do you come up with this uncertainty neighborhood? Let me define exactly what this uncertainty neighborhood is first. So uh, for those of you who have done machine learning and stuff like that, you probably are familiar essentially with the KL divergence. Uh, so to come up with like a, to come up essentially with any sort of parameterization for like this neighborhood, you essentially need to draw like an you know, geometry, you need to draw a circle with like a radius, right? Uh, we could have used any sort of distance because our workload is a probability vector. We could have used like, you know, Euclidean distance, like a, an L2 norm or something like that. Uh, but we chose this particular KL divergence because it makes sense as a statistical measure, right? So from this point forward, whenever we look at rho, essentially uh, there's a particular value of rho. So in this instance, 0.2, and I'm looking at all workloads with a particular KL divergence that's less than or equal to 0.2. So essentially I'm drawing a bubble around my expected workload. But how do you actually calculate this size based off of you know, your application? Uh, so this is like, this is not necessarily the focus of the work because this problem in itself is actually very interesting. Uh, but it, it can kind of come down to like an ML problem or like a historical forecasting problem, right? Um, so we recommend for a lot of our experiments, for example, we kind of like sampled a bunch of, uh, historical workloads and we took the maximum or the average uncertainty among workload pairings. Otherwise, if, you know, your user has like a very intuitive, def like intuitive, uh, definition of the KL divergence, you could just kind of come up with like workload uncertainty, uh, yourself by either drawing it or kind of like visualizing it, um, visualizing it through like, yeah, uh, graph means. Or you can guess be wrong yeah. and then have the system lock up when you go well beyond your expected uncertainty. 
and someone calls you at 5 a.m. And then, yeah, that's yep. that sounds about right. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this is this in itself is an interesting problem to essentially how do you come up with the uncertainty neighborhood? Because again, it's like a it's a game of chicken if you think about it. Uh, how much performance are you willing to sacrifice to essentially mitigate like a certain amount of risk? Right? It's it's a very big uh, game of chicken there about like how much you're willing to you know safety net yourself for because you can't just cover the whole space because uh, otherwise you'd just be trying to optimize for every type of uh, query or type of workload. Uh, but that's not, you know, realistic. Uh, if you want like the best performance to some degree, like within some risk factor, uh, you definitely want to, you know, try to balance out this idea of like uncertainty. Yeah. Um, so again, I talked a little bit about essentially solving the robust problem of that iterating over every possible workload is expensive, right? So two, three, even 30 workloads is very doable, but like, uh, at the end of the day, you know, with an insert, if you define the uncertainty set this way, you essentially come up with an infinite set uh, or just an extremely large set, and it's not possible to really go through uh, every single workload. So there's a little bit of math at this point, and I'm not necessarily going to go through uh, how this is done, but essentially the focus is taking this uh, uncertainty set and doing a lot of rewrites. Uh, rewrites over the optimization problem for us to be able to get to a uh, feasible optimization problem that we can essentially use off the shelf solvers for. Uh, so if anyone wants to talk about that, I can definitely do that offline because it's a little bit longer. Um, but the steps essentially that we take are just like a couple rewrites of the paper. Yeah. Cool. So with that in mind, uh, essentially the endure pipeline is Kind of looks at like, uh, kind of looks like the follow or the following, right? So, if you were to give me a workload characteristic, uh, so an expected workload plus some sort of uncertainty factor, like a neighborhood of uncertainty, uh, or like a couple example workloads, and we can calculate the uncertainty region, uh, you give this to Endure. Additionally, to with some system information, so things like page size, memory budget, um, essentially all the constraints that you want to add about the particular system that you plan to like throw an LSM tree on. And we give you two things. We give you a RocksDB configuration, because this is what we're particularly looking at right now. Uh, so an MFILT to assign a uh, size ratio to assign, and then different compaction policies that RocksDB supports. And then we also give you some expected performance characteristics. So again, because we essentially use this model of IO, we essentially have a lot of uh, we can essentially give you a bunch of like information about types of ex the expected performance that you can see over time for workload drift for particular configurations, and yeah, and this is the overall Endure pipeline. So beforehand, I'm before I go to results. Uh, are there any other questions? I don't see any I from see the... is writing up a storm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't see any from I don't see any from the audience um, or from from our research team here. The um, I think we got gotcha. you covered. Okay, cool. In previous questions, so I can go over the results because this is the most interesting part. Right? I'll go oh, over wait. the results of. Uh, so Myers oh, asking what ahead. are performance parameters? Uh, performance parameters. The are we talking about the parameters that? Oh. Um, yeah, so we basically give everything in terms of I.O. cost. Uh, it, I think that's what you're going for, Meyer. So estimate a number of I.O.s that you would take for like a certain you know period of time. Yeah, it's it, it's one of the ways that you can that that we can measure performance optimization, mm -hmm. um, measuring request time, which is ultimately what we care about, is a little bit more complicated. Um, mm -hmm. The um, uh, because you have to actually look at the interaction between different requests, simultaneous requests in the system. So mm -hmm. counting IOs is easier. And, and it's yeah, directly it's, related to request time. Yeah. So we'll see in a moment that, like, uh, what is it? it? It tends to be, they tend to correlate very well. So, uh, okay. Let's talk a little bit, I guess, about over this testing suite. So how we essentially uh, evaluated our robust tuning. So we took we implemented uh, Endure in Python because we're using some off-the-shelf solvers. So we're using like libraries like SciPy, um, and we implemented it in tandem with RocksDB. So it's integrated within essentially 
you can essentially run a Rocks CD instance with the recommended tuning that Endure gives, and you can also, you know, uh, run in Rocks CD without the recommended tuning that Endure gives, and then see the performance comparison between the two. Um, yeah. In addition, we come up with essentially a systematic way to take a look at different expected workloads. So we come up with this uncertainty benchmark where we kind of want to analyze a couple different types of workloads, right? So the uniform workload, where essentially you treat every single uh, query type the exact same, right? So not empty queries, empty queries, range queries, and writes. Unimodal workloads, or unidominating workloads, where these are workloads in which the designer just kind of expects that uh, one work or one query type is going to be the dominating factor. Bimodal with two work or two query types and trimodal with three. Uh, the reason why we have essentially one percent in all of these is again, if you give the API to do range queries, uh, you should expect some range queries at some point in time. So you should never, you know, not expect a feature unless you disable it. Additionally, we sample. Uh, a 10,000 random workloads essentially to use as a test set. So these, again, are just like essentially random probability vectors uh, that we can essentially use to measure and estimate the differences between all the performances. And the uh, the metric that we're going to use to essentially like show performance here is this normalized delta throughput. So uh, basically, if our cost is IO, one over the cost is going to be throughput. And we're taking a look at the difference between a nominal tuning, which is the tuning that you have without any uncertainty, and the robust tuning, which is one where you consider uncertainty. Uh, anything greater than zero means that the robust is doing better, where one essentially means that you have almost a two times two x speed up. OK, so the first study that I want to look at is essentially the impact of different workload types. So. To, uh, to explain this graph here, I have rho, which is this uncertainty parameter uh, that encompasses like how big the neighborhood is that you're considering for your robust tuning. And then your delta throughput is on the y-axis. And essentially, for each of these uh, each of these data points on this line graph, <coughs> excuse me, um, <clears throat> what I've done is I've taken 10,000 random workloads, uh, executed them on a database, and measured the average performance between, uh, and I did this for a robust configuration and a nominal configuration. Uh, the robust and nominal configurations are using one of the particular uh, unimodal bimodal workloads as its expected workload. So in this instance, for the unimodal workload, there's only one workload, which is the uh, 20 or 25% all around. Um, or sorry, unimodal workloads is a single dominating workload, while bimodal is two dominating workloads. Uh, so with bimodal, because there's uh, five of them, I just take the average over all of those, or six of them. Right. Uh, Heidi, Heidi wants to know, when you're talking about these random workloads, are these mm -hmm. from some workload data set, or are they generated for the test? Uh, so essentially, they're the same types of workloads that are generated from the YCSB benchmark, so like the Yahoo's uh, cloud service benchmark. Um, it's the exact same, more or less. Uh, We've also essentially like verified like these are these are the exact type of workloads that we uh, so Meta is the primary user of RocksDB of course because they're the ones developing it um, and we kind of verified based off of their own papers and stuff that like these are the type of workloads that they have seen in the past they haven't seen all of these in the benchmark set but from the ten thousand random workloads um, it's very similar to the type of workloads that you'd see at like Facebook okay. Um, OK, so for the for the two lines here, I essentially have uh, the average performance delta throughput for unimodal workloads and bimodal workloads, right? And the expected story, uh, the thing that I kind of want to point out here, right, is that like uh, at the zero mark, when rho is zero, the robust and the uh, the robust and the uh, nominal essentially do the same, more or less. They're like at the, uh, yeah, they essentially do the same because they give roughly the same tuning, plus or minus a little bit of differences there. However. As you start to increase the amount of uncertainty that you uh, are willing to accommodate for, right? So, like for example, at row is equal to one, uh, the unimodal and bimodal workloads, uh, you see like the average throughput that you would ever see uh, goes up. So you're almost looking at like a two x speed up for like the robust tunings over time. Uh, the reason being, right, is this ten thousand workloads differ very or like 
uh, they differ wildly from like the expected workloads <clears throat> that we have in the benchmark set. Uh, and the interesting part is, is that for unimodal and bimodal workloads, because you're putting so much emphasis on like one or two query types, uh, as you drift away from those query types, you definitely expect robust tunings to essentially do better because these robust tunings essentially accommodate for these other workload or query types. So, yeah. So these unbalanced workloads, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, then additionally, right, if we look at these other workloads that are uh, not as unbalanced, so these uh, the bimodal and uniform workloads, uh, we see the robust tuning can't do as well. So if I single out the uniform workload, right, we essentially treat every single query type the exact same, 25% across the board, right? Uh, what does this exactly mean? Well, you can't really robustly tune if you just treat every query type the same because any variation in your workload isn't really going to mean that much there. On the other hand, though, unbalanced workloads uh, result in a much better performance for robust because you essentially have overfitted with your nominal tuning. Any questions before we go forward? All right. OK, so if we look at the different types of expected workloads, uh, I also kind of wanted to comment, I guess, on the relationship between your uh, so this goes back to like Josh's kind of question about this idea of how you, how do you pick uncertainty, right? And it's this idea of uh, it's a very hard question because your performance gained really depends on uh, how well your observed uncertainty matches your like actual expected uncertainty. Right. So at the bottom here, rho is the expected uh, value that's given to the tutor. So in this instance, like, uh, you know, in Dur, you, you draw a neighborhood and then row is like a particular like radius, right? So again, if I look at like the, uh, this probably the simplex of the workload uh, figure that I drawn before, this is the green region, right? That we introduce and give to our pipeline. On the y-axis is the actual observed. So this is the observed uncertainty that you would ever see when you actually execute a expected workload, right? Uh, so, you know, you expect maybe like a radius of one, but you get a workload that happens to be like two units away. And what we essentially see is, right, the highest throughput always occurs when you're observe and expected row match. And I think that's pretty obvious. Like any, like, yeah, uh, anyone could have told you that, right? That like, you know, if your observed workload is one or observed uncertainty is one and your expected uncertainty you gave to the tuner is one, you're going to get like the best possible throughput. On the other hand, your lowest throughput happens when it's mismatched, right? So essentially, we get this, uh, you know, towards, we get the highest performance, though, towards the corner where your uncertainty is the highest and you expected the highest possible uncertainty that you could ever ask for. Um, but on the other hand, right, if you were to look at like uh, the zero line right at the bottom, when you give uncertainty to the tuner, uh, but you see no uncertainty at all, then you essentially, have poor performance over time. And I can redraw this picture in like a slightly different way that like makes things a little bit uh, interesting. So this is what I love about this type of problem, right? Is like there are many different types of visualizations that you can do for like robust and nominal tunings. Um, yeah, so on the, what I essentially have here is uh, another graph where each point represents a random excuse me, random uh, sampled workload executed on our different tunings. And then uh, I take the right delta throughput between the two of them, and I plot them as like a scatter plot here. So uh, in the top left, I essentially have the actual tuning. So in this instance, the robust tuning when rho is zero gave me leveling as a compaction policy, a particular size ratio, which is humongous. And then uh, we, we use mem, uh, mem fill as essentially a bits per element. So Bloom filters uh, get parameterized by essentially the number of bits that you would give. So we're giving four, about four and a half bits per element. And it's fine to be fractional for Bloom filters here. Uh, the expected workload is this interesting workload where it's all reads. The last uh, bin in this instance is like 1% writes. So range reads, non-empty uh, point reads and empty point reads are all treated equally. 
And yeah, Ro is the expected. This is the expected Ro giving to the tutor, right? And the when we execute a workload, we calculate essentially the uh, distance away that workload was from the expected workload, and we come up with uh, we plot them on the scatter plot, and we come up with this really nice figure here, right? So I can do this for different values of row, and we kind of see like a very increasing range of different throughput values. But we see a couple like from these plots, we see a couple interesting points, right? Um, the higher expected row accounts essentially uh, for more uncertainty. So as we essentially account for more uncertainty, you essentially can receive better performance of potential speed ups of up to almost 4x. But but only if you get more rights than than you are nominally expecting. Exactly, right? So only for the workloads that happen to be further away. <clears throat> so if we take a look, right, all of the... Uh, Everything on the bottom of the dash line represents like workloads that uh, the nominal uh, tuning happens to do better, right? Uh, and it kind of makes sense because you need to sacrifice some performance, right? So it's kind of clustered around this uh, zero to one, which what we're essentially saying is workloads that are very, very close to the expected workload, right? That have like very little kill divergence. We're talking like you know, changing essentially the distribution of reads. So like uh, maybe instead of 33, 33, 33, 1, it's like 34, 32, 33, and 1, right? Those workloads, of course, they look the exact same as the expected. So your nominal tuning is going to do perfectly fine. On the other hand, though, if you do receive uncertainty or workloads that happen to be further away, uh, you're going to get better and better performance the more you expect it. OK, so question for Dimitri. Yeah. Is there an upper <laughs> limit for uncertainty where the algorithm can't come up with a robust solution anymore? Um, or Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. So the there tends to be like a like a diminishing returns. At some point, you essentially we, we can treat this as like a uh, like a like a risk factor problem again, like a uh, conservative, like how conservative you want to be with like your tree structure, right? Um, and essentially, if you give it so much uncertainty, there comes a point where it's ba you're basically giving the algorithm uh, the expectation that it just needs to accommodate for all possible workloads. Uh, and the issue with that then is that you can't really accommodate for all possible types of workloads. So you come up with essentially a data structure that is as conservative as possible, and it essentially does equally as bad for all possible types of workloads. Basically, you'd end up you'd end up optimizing for uniform distribution in that case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you end up optimizing for uniform distribution, and the issue with that is you can't necessarily. I mean, yeah, you you can't really optimize for the uniform distribution there. Uh, you end up with just a tree that like does equally as bad in all workloads, right? And again, motivation behind part of this work is like you have some knowledge of your expected workload, um, but you expect some sort of variance. Right, you you always expect like a little bit of variance to some degree, uh, whether it's a lot or a little is kind of more up to how much risk you're willing to take on, but yeah. Um, and again, okay, I can draw the exact same picture again one more time. Uh, so this is another interesting picture to show essentially what does it mean to be robust. So again, row is the expected row given to the tuner. The throughput is at the bottom in this instance. So this is one over the I/O cost, and what we see is this histogram for. Uh, yeah, so uh, the bars in green represent essentially the throughput for uh, the average throughput for our robust tuning. And what we see is the peak of the distribution slowly creeps over time, right? So I can take a look at uh, an expected row of one, and the peak of the distribution is going to be slightly more to the right than the expected row of 0.25. Uh, and what this essentially means is if you give your database random workloads, right, if you start to accommodate for more uncertainty, the peak of your mean will slow, uh, the mean throughput that you see will slowly move right up to a certain point, right? Just as uh, uh, Dimitri had said earlier, up to a certain point, you will just receive more or less like a flat distribution. <laughs> OK, and lastly, uh, so all these experiments, again, were kind of done using like a model or more or less. So, we do want to see essentially how this works in like a more production system. So we essentially took a very large and 
long time to do this. Uh, but like a RocksDB instance with 10 million unique key value pairs of about a kilobyte. And we essentially executed, we essentially took these two tunings, the robust and the nominal tuning, um, and executed it uh, along different types of workloads. So this graph here is really interesting, but I'm breaking uh, I'm breaking this graph up into different observation periods. So this first observation period is about 200,000 queries, and there's five observation periods over this full like uh, experiment, right? So if I take a look at a specific point, uh, in this in this particular point here, this is uh, 40,000 queries. Uh, executed over the database, and I measure essentially the uh, IOs per query or the average IOs per query over time. And in the top right is the information for the expected workload, which is in this case a workload that's split between non-empty reads and writes. Um, and then W hat is the actual executed workload. So if I take the uh, average over all these different uh, observation periods, the executed workload is W hat right there. So this is interesting because this uh, this work the executed workload essentially has no writes, while the expected workload uh, has like almost half of your incoming queries to be uh, writes. Uh, for the sake of like display, I'm matching the row. So the expected row uh, given to the tuner is at the top, while the actual measured uh, costs. So essentially the uh, distance from the executed workload to the expected workload is at the bottom, IKL. Uh, and the, in this instance, they're the same because I want, uh, I kind of want to see what happens like when you match exactly for best performance. Uh, and some smaller caveats, writes are unique and range queries we dictate to be short range queries. Uh, the reason being is that uh, if you were to use an LSM tree, you kind of expect most of the time that your range queries to be short. Uh, if you ever run into a situation where your range queries have to be like long range queries, you're kind of better off just using a different data structure. Uh, LSM trees were not meant to handle like extremely long range queries at the end of the day. Yeah, that's that's what that's what B plus trees are designed for. Yeah. Okay. Well, so at the various compressed structures. Oh, Good. Yeah, there's a handful of different types of structures. Um, but LSM trees, like they support range queries, but they're not necessarily like the uh, end all be all for range queries. <laughs> so at the top and the bottom, uh, so these two graphs here, I have for these different sessions. Uh, the top is the model. So this is like what our expected count of IOs would be. And the middle is the system IO. So this is the actual measured IO on the system. Um, and we're just using, what is it? I believe we're just using. Uh, what is it, an AWS instance? Uh, but anyways, um, yeah, so the model IOs, the top system IOs in the middle here. And uh, what we essentially see is that the green line, uh, the robust tuning, does extremely well over these like kind of varying workloads over time. Uh, and the best part, right, is like, this is great. This is exactly what we want to see when like these uh, rows are matched, right? Um, and you can kind of visualize this as the, the deviation between all the dots in our robust workload uh, is much smaller. So it doesn't actually vary that much over time compared to like your nominal tuning when you start to receive a high number of range queries that like the uh, optimizer didn't expect, uh, the number of IOs in the system will like spike up. And additionally, we translate to take a look at like the latency or the average latency per query. So this is in milliseconds here. Um, and we see that like the IOs translates very, very well to latency in this instance. So over time, the, resp the latency response time uh, is pretty, uh, matches essentially the same sort of trend that we see in like the IOs. Um, and we also measure essentially the throughput. So the number of like queries per second that the actual system gets to be able to process. And here we see like a much, much higher throughput for the robust tuning because it's essentially accommodating the fact that it might see bursts of other workloads over time. Now, this is all so, reads, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, these are all reads. So um, there is a large number of other graphs in the paper. Uh, like we're talking for like all different types of workloads, like writes included. Writes are a little bit more complicated because it changes the structure of the tree over time. So the paper kind of addresses like uh, what happens there and how to essentially measure that properly. Um, in addition, we also show mismatched uh, rows. So if you're expect in expectation, the amount of uncertainty that you expect is much less than the actual observed uncertainty. 
Um, and we kind of go over those cases as well. Uh, but what we see is that like for most cases, it's better to assume just a little bit of uncertainty no matter what. Uh, you essentially pay very minimal uh, penalty in performance for potential gains later on in the future to like essentially save you um, from having to wake up at 5 a.m. for an emergency call. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you. So to kind of go over everything that we just went over, uh, I talked a little bit about like workload uncertainty and how this creates suboptimal tunings, taking a look at kind of like cost surfaces. Uh, we, so we introduced Endure, which is essentially this robust tuning pipeline that considers neighborhoods of workloads. Um, and we deployed it on RocksDB to show potential performance improvements. Uh, and we kind of hope that like, although this is on one particular system, I really hope that like, uh, this paradigm can essentially inspire or like be used for other types of tuning problems in the future. Because again, we this is pretty generic. It's just that we wanted a particular system to test it on to show real world improvement. Otherwise, again, you can find us at the DIS lab here at Boston University, so dis.bu.edu. Um, otherwise, my contact info is there. I haven't switched to Mastodon yet, but at some point. Um, but yeah, thank you so much again, Red Hat, for uh, inviting me to to speak at research days it's been pretty fun i can see that the chat is uh yeah if you want to if you want to stop sharing um and we'll bring stuff up yeah um monos you still there uh he just stepped out for a second for a phone call but yeah okay um <clears throat> okay i uh, so do to do so questions um i are, are any of the artifacts, like the test configuration and that sort of thing, available for other people to try to reproduce? Yeah, so if you were to go to my uh, if you were to my website or the DIST website, you can also contact me too. But like everything is open source, so it's uh, on GitHub. Um, just the easy choice for distribution. Um, but yeah, everything is there, including... So it's not just the pipeline to actually... Uh, what is it like deploy on RockCB instances, but you can also see all the analysis and like do double checks yourself, right? If you want, like are interested in essentially the uh, different kind of like analyses that we do and to explore a little bit more about this whole like robust versus non-robust paradigm. Yeah. Uh, other questions. Um, is yeah. there any reason why this approach couldn't be extended to other data structures um, such yeah. as, yeah, uh, bee trees or... Um, Oh, was the one we talked? Um, I'm I'm blanking on the generic name for compressed index or organized structures. Uh, column stores. Column stores. Yeah. So there are. So actually, yeah. So my whole PhD essentially is looking at this robust paradigm for other data structures as well. So I've been taking a look at like there. There's absolutely no reason why this can't be done. Um, so I've been taking a look, for example, at B epsilon trees. So like. Uh, for example, VMware just came out, right? Uh, they released a while back, like SplinterDB, which is like a key value store, um, but it's based off of the Epsilon tree, but it has the same sort of problem setting where it has tunable parameters that you can uh, go for. Um, in addition, this this totally could be done as well for things like Postgres um, or MySQL. Uh, it just is a matter of how complex it needs to be. So yeah. the issue with like, once you get to higher, you know, kind of data stores like that, or like a databases like that, um, the relationship between your configuration knobs and IOs is like, it's pretty hard to map out. Uh, one of the bigger limitations, I guess, of this work is like, we need essentially a cost model to use to play around with the math. Um, but uh, what is it? There is some work that I've been doing along with like estimating costs using like some ML techniques that you can use as a proxy, but yeah. Yeah, that's one of your problems is if you're looking at a whole database system mm -hmm. and not just a single data structure is that you have a lot more configuration variables. Yeah, yeah, and it blows up pretty fast. So, yeah. The um, um, Okay, Heidi, I'm not quite understanding the question. 8 million results in the artifact. There are, yeah, I mean, like, there's a lot, there's a lot of results of the artifacts. <laughs> um, there's a lot of plots in the artifacts to uh, like at, at least online to show like the different types. You can also just run things yourself, um, but the workload like the workload generators to generate the benchmark, but also like the random workloads that we see are are there as well, and uh, they provide essentially the same figures that you've seen today, but extensively for like 
15 to 20 different expected workloads. We give different scenarios as well. There's a lot to play around with. Yeah. That's how many variations you did. Yes. So, right. 10, 10 million key value pair. I, yeah. <laughs> Were there any config settings that you don't bother changing? Yeah. Uh, so there's a handful, right? So RocksDB has something like, uh, like 150 like different knobs. Uh, so the reason why we don't call this a rocks DB paper is um, we tried to do it a bit more generic to LSM trees. Uh, so things like size ratio, memory buffer, filter memory, um, and compaction policies are universal. So if you look at Cassandra, for example, uh, their implementation of an LSM tree will essentially have all those types of parameters as well. Level DB also has this. Um, anything essentially that uses an LSM tree will need to make decisions on those parameters. Yeah. And I, I mean, as an example, there's um, looking across this, Andy and I have actually talked about doing this in Postgres. And to mm -hmm. make the problem actually testable, what you have to do is isolate it to a relative handful of configuration settings. Um, mm -hmm. Because otherwise, um, among other things, the number of test runs you have to do to verify things becomes um, just really impossible. So like, um, when we were talking about Postgres, we were talking about changing potentially five to eight configuration settings um, rather than Postgres's entire 300 odd knobs that it has. Yeah, there are there's some studies that have been done for like scaling. Um, like I, I haven't necessarily worked on too much about like how to essentially compact knobs together. Um, but there has been some studies at least done, at least in the last like recent VLDBs, for example. Uh, like there's this paper from Wisconsin called Llama Tune that they do a lot with like how to essentially shrink knob your knob space. Um, but that in conjunction essentially works the exact same way with like this robust paradigm. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's actually sort of a different problem because, you know, for any sort of data system, you have this um, practitioner knowledge of certain combinations of configuration that are just not going to work um, mm -hmm. and therefore you can eliminate those out of the problem space except that I will tell you that over time you find out that some of that knowledge is mistaken and and so that ends up becoming a completely different set of problems to actually figure out what part of the problem space is outside of practitioner knowledge but actually shouldn't be yeah it's definitely Black magic to us, yeah. To <laughs> yeah, well, true. no, it's yeah. it's. I mean, the problem is that practitioner knowledge is based on experience, right? And to give you an example of something that happened over time, right, is that when I started with database performance, I started in the spinning disk era, and so there was a whole bunch of configuration ranges that we stuck to based on the performance of spinning disks, and then there was this whole period where solid state storage was introduced where we didn't really change that and we should have, and eventually we did, right? Because until we discovered that things that we thought were so extreme that they would result in the database locking up were actually perfectly valid settings with solid state storage. Um, and in, in some cases, optimal settings. Um, but like I said, that's kind of a different set of, of problems, right? Is that this set of problems we're saying, hey, if we're assuming that the practitioner knowledge is approximately correct, right? Is somewhere in the neighborhood of correct. How mm -hmm. do we optimize? Yeah, yeah. Never discount your previous knowledge exists for a reason, right? So like uh, never discount what's there, but just uh, you always have to just assume that there's some variability. That's like the biggest, I guess, takeaway of this work. Yeah. So yeah. any other questions? We have a few more minutes. Yeah, no, uh, if there's not any other, thank you so much, guys, though. Yeah, I'm really glad to be able to come present today about, like, you know, robust database. I think it's, like, a very, you know, uh, it's a very interesting topic. I think that I'm really surprised has not been, like, explored in more depth. So I'm kind of hoping to slowly uh, introduce a bit more over time. So, you know, watch out. I'll be around. Um, I'm always, you know, I, I plan on essentially releasing a bit more about, like, different robust systems. So, yeah, keep an eye out for that. Yeah, and in the long term, it'll be nice to see this approach start getting integrated into actual um, field database tools, um, which I, I expect it to be. 
as as we move beyond from research to practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even outside of databases, right? Like anything that's sort of like, uh, that sounds like a tuning problem, if it's like a system that needs to be yeah. changed for performance reasons, it's it, it falls in the same ballpark, so. Yeah, one of the one of the areas we've looked at this is actually we've introduced a feature into Kubernetes called uh, vertical auto scaling, where mm -hmm. you automatically allocate more, um, uh, for example, memory to applications based on their demands. Um, but there's an kind of an obvious um, failure case there, and and yeah. so one of the robust turning questions is how do we put limits that optimize um, application performance without reaching a failure case. Um, yeah. The, um, I, you know, which is nothing to do with data structures at all, but a very similar robust tuning problem. Yeah, it's it's uh, this idea of like robust tuning or like, you know, risk management, I think is like very common in systems. So I'm hoping that like this type of work could be expanded further into like, you know, other uh, areas of systems research as well. Yeah. Well, that's, um really interesting it was fun to have all these insights into database uh tuning um yeah. thank you so much for joining us andy and thank you manos for um giving the introduction and answering lots of questions um and thank you josh for being our guide and uh uh asking the things that probably lots of people were wondering about when they uh were watching this but were just uh, a little too hesitant to speak up themselves so um it's great to push the boundaries and we're really glad to have you with us doing that. Um, thank you for having us. It was an absolute pleasure. We will um, yes, be you. sending out the recording for this to everybody who attended and letting other people know. So you can catch this on YouTube later, later if you um, want to tell your friends about it. <laughs> um, and also uh, any other papers or other results from the project we keep on the Red Hat Research um, webpage, which you can find pretty easily by searching for Red Hat Research. Um, and and feel free to reach out with questions about material. We are happy to share uh, any material or details about our project. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, Jen would like to remind people that the next Research Days talk is on March 15th. So if you're interested and want to uh, follow up on the next topic, um, that'll be coming out in email soon and also on the website. So thanks everybody for joining us. Um, have a good lunch or dinner or breakfast. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you guys.